Hello and welcome to this video on chemical thermodynamics. This video is going to be about the, the properties of matter. At the end of this video you'll be able to define a state function, calculate uh, delta H from the heat capacity, explain heat capacity properties of an ideal gas, liquid and solid, and then calculate delta H across a phase change. So state functions are functions that depend only on your current state. They do not depend how you get to that state. So these functions are what you call path independent. So in the picture here, you can see people standing around. So where they are is a state function. It doesn't really matter how they got there, uh, but I can tell you where they are at the moment. In addition to that, I can tell you how exactly how far it is between those people. But it doesn't matter how they all got there or what the path is to actually get to them. Okay, the direct line is a state function. A path function depends on the path taken. Okay, so, so how far uh, one of these people need to walk to meet the other person is a path function. You can't know how far they've walked unless you know what path they've actually taken. And so things that are state functions are stuff like temperature, pressure, uh, volume, energy, internal energy, enthalpy. Okay, all those things are state functions. Path functions are uh, work and heat. And we need to know what's going on in the system to be able to uh, quantify those things. So because of these properties, uh, from a mathematical point of view, state functions have exact differentials. So having an exact differential means that we're able to integrate between one state and another and figure out exactly the change in that state function. But for a path, we need to know what the path is to be able to do the integration. So the example on the right here Process A and process B have different amounts of work because they follow different paths. But the change in volume between point one and point two is the same regardless of which path you take. So if we're going to have a look at the properties of matter, then where we start is by looking at a system that contains one mole of substance. So the system doesn't have any flow into it or flow out of it, so we can cross those terms out. It's not doing any shaft work. And so, so for this fixed amount of stuff, we can simplify our energy balance down to saying that the change in internal energy is equal to uh, the heat added less the pressure times by the change in volume of the system and so so this is the underlying basis for a number of the properties that we're going to talk about next so if we add a little bit of heat to a closed system so so if it's a, a closed system and a constant volume system then dv will be equal to zero so from the previous equation, we can say that the change in internal energy is equal to the heat that we add to the system. And so we know from experience and observation that when we do add that heat, there'll be a change in temperature. And so what we do is we, we add in this thing called heat capacity, and that allows us to, uh, to quantify what that change in internal energy is per change in temperature. So an important thing that we've got here is that we're looking at partial derivatives. And so in this case, in this system, we're looking at a constant pressure system instead of a constant volume system. And so if I add some heat at constant pressure, the temperature is going to change and I can define my constant pressure heat capacity as the H to T. So the change in H with respect to temperature 
as I keep my pressure constant. Okay, so, so make sure you familiarize yourself with the notation for partial derivatives. So because we'll be using them a lot throughout the course. Now, an ideal gas is the simplest equation of state that you can have. And it's the basis for all the equations of state that we'll discuss later on in the course. Now, what defines something as an ideal gas is that uh, an ideal gas must have motion, kinetic energy, and therefore it must have a, a finite temperature. It can't be at zero degrees Kelvin. There is no interaction between molecules. And the molecules are infinitely small. So they don't interact and they don't interfere with each other in any way, shape or form. That's the key property of an ideal gas. Now, when you have those properties, what you find is that uh, even though we know for a real gas that the internal energy is a function of temperature, and it also has to be a function of something else, okay? You need to define two things. So uh, you can say it's a function of volume or a function of pressure. Uh, here we're just going to say it's a function of volume. But for an ideal gas, because nothing is happening between the molecules, then it doesn't matter how far apart those molecules are. And so then the extension of that is, is that the internal energy of an ideal gas is not a function of the molar volume. It's a function of temperature only because temperature affects those things that we talked about uh, when we talked about energy, how molecules have translation, rotation, bond bending. Okay. All those things uh, for an ideal gas are not affected by the distance between molecules. And then if our internal energy is a function of temperature only, then if we turn to look at the enthalpy, and so the enthalpy is just the internal energy plus PV. And so for an ideal gas, we know PV is equal to, to RT. And so we see that the enthalpy is also a function of temperature only as well for an ideal gas. Okay, I have to stress that. And so this is a very, very useful property um, because what we can do is we can define a, a heat capacity for an ideal gas and we can tabulate that data because we couldn't possibly tabulate the heat capacity at uh, all different temperatures and also at all different pressures. So, so what we do is we tabulate uh, constants in an equation for the heat capacity. Okay, so, so if you're looking at processes over a large temperature range, let's say with something to do with pyrometallurgy or any high temperature reaction, uh, like a furnace, um, then the heat capacity of some things can change enormously. So we see in this plot on the right here that, that the heat capacity of both water and carbon dioxide change a lot as you increase the temperature. And so uh, not only do we have the internal energy uh, and both the enthalpy, uh, independent of volume and pressure for an ideal gas, um, this allows us to actually set up a relationship between the constant pressure heat capacity and the constant volume heat capacity. And that relationship is, is given here. So once you do the derivation, it's a very simple relationship. Now, if we want to calculate how the internal energy changes or the enthalpy changes from one temperature to another temperature, we need to integrate the heat capacity. Okay, so, so if the heat capacity is a function that depends on temperature, then by definition, we have to integrate that. Okay, so we can't just uh, do Cp delta T. Okay, so, so if the heat capacity changes a lot over the temperature range from T1 to T2, you have to integrate it to get the change in delta H and delta U. Only in the case where Cp is constant over the temperature range that you're interested in, can you say uh, delta H is equal to Cp delta T. Okay, if you've got a small temperature difference or if Cp is constant, that's fine, you can do that. 
Now, for a liquid and a solid, the, the heat capacity actually behaves in a similar way to an ideal gas. So if your liquid and your solid can be considered incompressible, and most of them can be, as long as your pressure isn't absolutely ridiculous, then the enthalpy, uh, the internal energy, and then by extension, the heat, constant volume heat capacity and the constant pressure heat capacity are functions of temperature only if your liquid and your solid are incompressible. Okay, and this is a, a very useful property. And so, so in the previous couple of slides, we looked at how you can calculate the change in enthalpy uh, going from T1 to T2 using the heat capacity. Now, if there's a phase change in between T1 and T2, we have to take that into account if we're trying to figure out how the enthalpy changes between those two points. And so this is uh, an enthalpy temperature plot, so enthalpy on the y-axis, uh, temperature on the x-axis. And so what it's showing are the three stages of heating something that goes through a phase change. So initially it's in the alpha phase, we heat it up. Uh, and to calculate the delta H between those two points, we need to integrate the heat capacity. You hit a phase change. And so uh, from, uh, from that point to the next point, then it's just the, the heat of uh, transformation from one phase to another. Okay, and, and that happens at constant temperature, okay, where it's melting or it's vaporizing. And then after it's melted or vaporized, then you go through a heating phase again. Okay, so, so you're just adding these steps together. There's nothing new here on this slide uh, in terms of uh, the, the components that you're putting together. But if you're wanting to go across that phase change, then you need to take each of those steps into account. So to recap what we've done in this video, state functions are path independent. We can take partial derivatives of thermodynamic properties. The energetic properties of an ideal gas, internal energy, enthalpy, and heat capacity depend on temperature only. For an incompressible liquid or solid, then the CP can be approximated as being a function of temperature only as well. And finally, a path can be used to calculate changes in enthalpy when there is a phase change. Okay, thank you for your time and attention.